What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I'm your host. I can be found on Twitter at KyleYNFL. I am joined today by Derek Brown at Debro underscore FFB of Fantasy Pros. Debro, how are we doing today, my friend? Doing good, Yates. I mean, look, uh, this is kind of the downtime, people call it, in the offseason, but I know just like me, you're out there in the Dynasty streets uh, making trades, doing some best ball and stuff, so... A lot of things to talk about, even though a lot of people say there's not enough news and not really a lot to dive into. We're going to get into it, man. Hey, there was some stuff going on on Twitter today that I just wanted to kind of get away from, right? This is the down season. There's some stuff on Twitter that you're just like, I just don't need to see this right now. Yeah. Let's focus in. Let's do something productive with our time. Let's actually talk about some early round values here today, taking a look at rounds one through five and taking a look at the players that we think are value selections, the players that shouldn't be going as late in those rounds as they are. Before we get into that, though, kicking off a new segment here that I wanted to kind of have some fun, right? I wanted to have some fun here. I'll be doing this from periodically on the podcast question of the day here all right so what i'm doing here is turning to the premium discord which you can get into patreon.com slash the fantasy playbook five dollars a month gets you access into the premium discord here asking this question this one comes from schwartz d bro which kansas city wide receiver are you targeting this year right we've got sky Moore, the rookie from western michigan we got marquez valdez scantling coming over from green bay and then of course juju smith schuster making his way over from pittsburgh to kansas city so out of those three guys, there's a lot of ambiguity right now. You can see that in ADP as well. Which one of these three are you targeting this year? Oh, man, come on. I've been out in the streets, and I've been trying to tell people the good word about Sky Moore, and I've been labeled somewhat of a Juju Smith-Schuster hater, Yates. Uh, it's it's a fact. It's happened. I'm not going to shy away from it, man. I'm all in on Sky Moore. I've got him ranked as a top 36 wide receiver for this upcoming season, and the thing about it is, is that you have Juju, who has been, I mean, over the last three to four seasons, even counting injuries, the efficiency metrics have been terrible. He's yeah. dropped off in yards after catch per reception and yards per route run in each of the last four seasons. So consider me out on Juju and all in on Sky Moore. I think a lot of people are going to say, well, you can look at those declining metrics for Juju Smith-Schuster and look who his quarterback was, right? Like with Big Ben, mm -hmm. okay, yes, there's a point to be made there, but we also saw Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool do exactly. phenomenal things for fantasy and Juju didn't. So I agree with you there. It's interesting to look at the ADP though. Juju is wide receiver 36 in ADP. Sky Moore is wide receiver 64 currently. Now that's a little bit different. That's in ADP consensus looking at fantasy pros. So it takes, I think, Yahoo, Fantrax, uh, and Sleeper. Sleeper is up like way higher than in Yahoo and Fantrax currently. I think that's going to change as we move. So that's kind of pushing him a little bit down the board. And then MVS at wide receiver 53. That's the wide receiver that I'm targeting this year. I think Sky Moore is going to be great. I love Sky Moore coming out of Western Michigan. But MVS is the guy who I want as that flex wide receiver on my roster, uh, in my lineup there, at to give me those big performances here, those big boom weeks, being able to catch that 60-yard touchdown deep downfield. Some weeks he might give me two for 20. I acknowledge that. But in that flex spot, you can live with that, especially when he's going off the board at wide receiver 53. All right, before we get into the early round value conversation here, got a couple things that I want to tell the people about. First off is the fan tracks giveaway that's going on here for the months of June and July. This is a signed DK Metcalf Seattle Seahawks jersey. To enter into this giveaway, go over to the ffplaybook.com slash fan tracks giveaway for all the details. We'll take you less than five minutes to sign up. Again, that is for a signed DK Metcalf Seattle Seahawks jersey. Additionally, I mentioned it earlier, patreon.com slash fantasy playbook. Multiple tiers there on what you can get access to. $5 gets you access into the premium Discord. $10 gets you access into all of my premium content. And then $30 a month gets you access into an exclusive channel within the Discord. Here's what's upcoming here on the Patreon. $10 a month. I've got redraft busts, sleepers, breakouts, values, high upside players, bounce back candidates, some premium research tools that I've been working on, and top 100 player notes. I have a lot to do between now and August. So this is all that is coming up here over the next couple months over on patreon.com slash the fantasy playbook. Tune in there, $5 a month, $10 a month. Make sure that you join in, get some awesome content, get ready for your fantasy football drafts, and help support the show in the process. All right, Debra, let's kick off this conversation here, right? We're going to take a look at the early rounds here, rounds one through five, all right? So we're going to go through the top 60 in overall ADP, we're going to break these down into different sections here. We're going to talk about the players that we truly are fascinated with in these rounds, the ones that we believe are going to offer the biggest value currently. So what I'll do here is looking over at Fantasy Pros' ADP consensus here, we're going to take a look at 1 through 12. That's Jonathan Taylor as the number one overall player. Then we got Austin Eckler, Derek Henry, Cooper Cup, Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey, Najee Harris, 
Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Devontae Adams, Nick Chubb, and Joe Mixon as those top 12 players. Out of that group of 12 players in round one, which one stands out to you? Dalvin Cook is the guy that I've really, really warmed up to Yates over the last few weeks. And he is one of the, I've got four running backs in my tier one. It's Jonathan Taylor, you've got uh, Christian McCaffrey, and I got Najee Harris and Dalvin Cook. And Dalvin Cook makes the list, and I think that him going at the tail end of the first round is way, way too late. You'll see him maybe slip to the middle of the first round. I'm willing to take him as high as like top five, top seven-ish. I think he is primed for a fantastic season. We've seen Cook just ball out. Like over the last three years, RB9, RB2, RB2. Like he has got RB1 overall upside in his range of outcomes, considering that we're hearing all these rumblings out of Vikings camp. They're going to use him more in the passing game. And that's really what takes his game to another level. Like after, before last year, when his efficiency in the passing game dropped off a little bit, we're looking at a running back where it was eighth and 11th in yards per route run amongst all running backs with 20 or more targets. So give me the upside on Dalvin Cook. And I don't think he's too old. I don't think that the injuries are a massive concern. And really that kind of gets overblown for a player that we've seen just reel off back-to-back -back consecutive seasons of 13, 14 games played. Really, really love Dalvin Cook. And if he, I can get him, sometimes he'll fall near the turn, Yates. And that's just right. ludicrous to me. So all in on Dalvin Cook this year. All right, honesty time. Do you still play fantasy football on the same platform you have for the last several years because it would be just too much of a pain to make the switch to something better? You know it has its limitations and it doesn't do everything you want it to, but it would be this huge ordeal to move to a different platform, if there even is a platform out there that does what you need. Fantrax is the easiest to use fantasy football platform in the entire industry, and they have just about every setting you could possibly want to play fantasy the way that you want. On top of all that, Fantrax makes it incredibly easy to import in your entire previous league. Just a few clicks of a button and you're ready to roll for 2022. If you're ready to join the most customizable and easy to use platform out there, sign up for free today at Fantrax.com playbook and be entered to win a signed DK Metcalf Seattle Seahawks jersey. Create your free account and then head over to the FFPlaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway for all the details on how to enter. That's the ffplaybook.com slash F-A-N-T-R-A-X giveaway for all the details. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. I love Dalvin Cook this year as well. Someone who I sat down and did a study here recently and came away like buying into Dalvin Cook again this year, mm -hmm. right? He was someone that I was kind of like, okay, yeah, like if I can get Dalvin Cook at a value, I'll take him. But 45 red zone rush attempts last year, only five rushing touchdowns, right? If he can maintain that opportunity in the red zone, plus get an uptick in the receiving game. I think those numbers bounce back from a rushing touchdown perspective. I think that he's in line for a massive season. The other guy in this tier that I wanted to, or in this round that I wanted to highlight was Joe Mixon, right? And this is on brand for me. Looking back last year, I was all in on Joe Mixon after the injury concerns from 2020, right? People kind of just completely wrote him off. I remember talking to people that were casual fantasy football play players, and they were like, I'm never drafting this guy again because of what uh, Zach Taylor did to us in 2020, right? Not putting him on the IR right away. What did he do in 2021, though? In 2021, he logged the third most snaps out of any player at the running back position. He finished with the third most rushing yards. He finished with the fourth most rushing touchdowns. He finished with the sixth highest PFF grade for running backs with over 150 rush attempts. And he finished with the fourth most yards after contact. So there's the, the metrics that signal, okay, Joe Mixon is a fantastic running back. He produced really well. But what about from a fantasy perspective, right? We know that he finished the year as the RB3. But what did that look like? Because a lot of other running backs got injured, right? We had Derrick Henry, we had Christian McCaffrey, those top tier guys missed time. He was the RB4 in points per game behind only Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor, and Austin Eckler in half PPR scoring. He is the RB8 off the board, number 12 overall. This is another season, another year where people are sleeping on Joe Mixon. And he got an upgrade on the offensive line this year. They went into this offseason, the Bengals did, and signaled that we are going to take care of this offensive line. And so now we have... This offense that I still think is just getting going. Don't forget that Joe Burrow wasn't able to practice with this team throughout the most the majority of last offseason, and they still went to the Super Bowl, right? So if we can get Burrow a full offseason practicing with Jamar Chase, with T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, Joe Mixon, now we got the offensive line in front of him. I think Mixon's in line for another big year. You're telling me that I can get him behind someone like Nick Chubb? I will gladly take Joe Mixon there in that offense. All right, let's turn it back over to you. Let's look at round two here. I'll list off these players here. At number 13 overall, we got Travis Kelsey, then Stephon Diggs, Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, Alvin Kamara, Debo Samuel, Tyreek Hill, C.D. Lamb, Josh Allen, Mark Andrews, Aaron Jones, 
And then we got AJ Brown squeaking his way into the top 24. All right, for you in round two, who stands out to you? So I'm going to mention a guy that I think is going to make it into round two. Right now, he's going a little bit later than this, but this is, again, talking about the value. If I'm telling you that I'm willing to take this guy in round two, then obviously, if he slips to round three, it's a smash. Every single draft, and that is Saquon Barkley. For a lot of the reasons, Yates, you talked about being in on Joe Mixon, and everybody was out because they had been hurt. Their poor feelings, their lineups, their teams have been crushed by the high equity they put into this running back in previous years. Everything is different for Saquon Barkley, and no, this is not just a low-hanging fruit of Brian Dayball. This Giants offensive line is going to be quietly much, 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 much improved from a run-blocking standpoint. You had... John Feliciano, who has been top 20 in not only run blocking grades, but zone run blocking grades over the last few years. And that's important because the Giants coaching staff just talked about, let's get away from all this gap power garbage that Garrett and Judge and Freddie Kitchens of the world decided they were going to run with Saquon Barkley. Let's get him back running zone. After he ran 50% zone last year, the years where he was just crushing the league, top 10 in yards after contact per attempt, he was 62% zone runs. And this matters a lot because John Feliciano, top run blocking zone guard. If you just go back to as recent as 2020, now you add in Mark Gwiniski, I always butcher his name, man. I, every single time. I never get it right. <laughs> but he was 18th in zone run blocking grades per PFF last year. And you add in Evan Neal. This run blocking unit is going to be fantastic. Plus, we're getting word out of Giants camp. They're going to use him in the receiving game, which makes a ton of sense because Kenny Galladay is a dust ball. The other receiving options are unproven. Sterling Shepard's coming off an Achilles. They have nobody at tight end. I think Saquon Barkley is going to be a smash. And... I want to bring him up here as my round two guy because he's not going there currently. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to climb there the closer we get to the season, and I'm all in it. Like, take him in the second round. I would take him at the top of the second round. That's fine with me because I think the upside and the talent is there, and we didn't even discuss the fact that he's in a contract year. We know Mm -hmm. this man wants to get a bag, and what best way to do that is by going out, proving that you can stay healthy, and balling out behind a much, much improved offensive line. To begin this offseason, I had really been very skeptical on Saquon Barkley. I'd kind of been out, right? And if you get him into the fourth, the fifth round, sure, I will take the shot on him as my RB3. I think that that's worth the upside. But the more that we are hearing, you mentioned a lot, it's coming out of Giants camp. A big thing, too, that you didn't even mention is that Saquon Barkley saying he's starting to trust his knee again, right? That is a huge part here, too, where for someone who relies so much on that lateral mobility, that ability to stop and start and plant his foot, you need to be able to trust your knee. And if he's saying that he wasn't last year, could lead to an explanation of why his production really, really took a dip on top of everything else, right? The offensive line, the play calling, everything, right? So he's one of those potential home run picks. And if you can get him at the value, I think that's the point that you're trying to make here. If you can get him even further down the board, which we didn't even mention him in that top 24, you mentioned he's going outside of that. That's where you're absolutely willing to buy in and you are willing to take him even higher than where he's going. For me, I'm going to point out number 20 overall player here. That was C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb is the guy that I'm pointing out, going to point out here as that round two value for me. The talent has always been there for C.D. Lamb. We loved him coming out of Oklahoma. A dynamic player after the catch, someone who was able to just be a dominant receiving threat at his time at Oklahoma. But he fell into a very, very crowded offense. And even despite that, he's been solid for fantasy over the first two years. Wide receiver 20 and wide receiver 18 over his first two seasons. For 2022 now, though, Amari Cooper is out of town. Michael Gallup is rehabbing from the injury. So it's really C.D. Lamb. This is C.D. Lamb's wide receiver core. You have guys like Jalen Tolbert, James Washington. I mean, Dalton Schultz is there, and I think Dalton Schultz is going to eat from a target share perspective, but there's more than enough volume there for C.D. Lamb to see 140-plus targets this year, and I think that he is absolutely going to smash. Lamb's versatility lends itself to him having a massive year. In 2021, 56.4% of his snaps out wide, 42.4% in the slot. This is a guy who's not just being asked to line up out wide and stay there. He's moving around the formation. They're going to be creative in how they get the ball in his hands. He's never coming off the field. He's in line for a ton of targets. I think top five wide receiver is in the range of outcomes here for C.D. Lamb. And yeah, he's going as a wide receiver eight off the board, but he's going behind guys like Debo Samuel and Tyreek Hill currently. I will gladly take C.D. Lamb over both of those guys because of how just in love I am with C.D. Lamb for this next year and his uh, projected production. All right, let's go to round three here. Looking at players 25 through 36, Antonio Gibson, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, Saquon Barkley, like we mentioned here earlier, Leonard Fournette, 
Patrick Mahomes, T. Higgins, David Montgomery, Ezekiel Elliott here at number 33 overall. Then we got Kyle Pitts, Deontay Johnson, and Cam Akers to round out round three. Who in this range stands out to you, Debra? So I'm actually, I'm again, I'm going to go with a guy that I think should be in this round three conversation. And people, they're admitting their bias, he hates. They're saying, okay, I don't like Jalen Hurts. I think he's terrible. And we still hear this. It's out on Twitter on a daily basis. And I want to tell people that you should be drafting A.J. Brown aggressively this year. Because honestly, he has wide receiver one overall upside in his range of outcomes. And people are going to say, well... Okay, but the Eagles are going to run a ton. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to throw a lot more than everybody thinks they are. Last year, they tried to go pass heavy, and it didn't work. They didn't have the weapons around Jalen Hurts to do this. And now we're looking at A.J. Brown, who it's not hard to imagine him walking out of this upcoming season with the most target volume that he's ever gotten in his career coming from a Titans team that's always been run heavy, and regardless of whatever script they're in, and A.J. Brown's been one of the most efficient wide receivers in the NFL. Basically, since he's coming to the league gates, fifth, second, and fifth in yards per route run. Also, we look at the touchdown production. He has two seasons under his belt where he has been top five amongst all receivers in receiving touchdowns. And he's done this without having red zone usage. Basically, he's never finished higher than 29th in red zone targets in the NFL. So you're telling me now he's going to be the de facto wide receiver one. They've paid him. They traded for him as such. I think this offense is going to pass more than people think. It sure as hell is going to pass more than the Titans have ever done. Right. And we have all this elite efficiency to boot. Yes. Go grab AJ Brown. Please do it. Because he's going way too late in drafts. I, I bumped him up, Yates. Like, he is inside my top 12 players overall. And I know people mm. can say, and I'm not saying for people to have to go draft him as such. Right. You're not going to have to go draft him in the first round. But I have him as wide receiver seven, man. We've seen the efficiency. Now if the target volume follows it, it's wheels up. Yeah, that's the difference, right? As we're looking at A.J. Brown, it's all going to come down to what you project this offense to be from a passing volume perspective. If you believe that they're going to be kind of what it, they were for the majority of, you know, that latter half of last season, then I think A.J. Brown is still a fine wide receiver. He still deserves to be in the top 12. You get a very, very high floor every single week. But if you, like what you're saying, if you see those pass attempts tick up, then we got A.J. Brown, that wide receiver one overall upside, right? Because we know the talent. It's never been a question about the talent, just a matter of the volume. And I think that if you do see the Philadelphia Eagles pass a little bit more, you could get that. I'm a little bit hesitant, a little bit skeptical that they're going to do that because it really did work, right? Them running the ball as much mm -hmm. as they did last year. It really did work. So I think it's just a matter of what do you project? Are you willing to take that chance? Even, But he's the perfect player to take the chance on, to reiterate your point, because you're still getting the very high floor regardless you're getting the very high floor he's not going to fall outside of the top 12 wide receivers even if we do see a similar passing volume to what they had in tennessee so aj brown there your third round player you have something to add there uh yeah i'm curious yates because i know you're in the projection game and i don't know like i know this is probably a patreon thing it's behind the paywall but i'm curious have you gotten to the eagles projections yet like yeah. where are you sitting with aj brown like target volume yeah, for sure. So I've got the pass attempts for the Philadelphia Eagles uh, at 476 overall. So okay. de and with 561 rush attempts. So definitely a run heavy team still. Mm -hmm. AJ Brown with 119 targets, 75 receptions, 1,065 yards, seven receiving touchdowns. So it's still someone that I believe is going to give you a very, very high floor. You have to account that you got Devontae Smith in town. You got Dallas Goddard. Both of those guys are going to see target share. But I've got uh, A.J. Brown projected with a 25% target share, which is among the top of the league. And that just goes to, to show you if I change that to 525 pass attempts, you know, like if mm -hmm. we see them uh, uptick a couple pass attempts per game on average, then we've got the passing volume going up to the targets going up to 140, 130 per year uh, over this, the course of this year for AJ Brown. And that's where we could really see him push that number one overall upside. Yeah. And the other thing that needs to be pointed out with every projection set, if people are doing it right, which I know you are, it's a median, it's a median. So we're saying exactly. that like, this is exactly. his median projection. And if the Eagles go more pass heavy, then the sky's the limit as well as he be outperforms the touchdown expectations and gets into the double digits. Hell, if he gets like right. 12 touchdowns this year, then he's going to blow the roof off of what people think he's going to possibly do. 
Absolutely. All right. For me here in round three, I'm going to point out Ezekiel Elliott. And it's crazy that we've gone with Zeke, who has never finished outside the top 12 running backs in fantasy throughout the course of his career down here at RB 17 overall in ADP consensus. But there's a lot. I mean, there's it's justified that he's here because of what we saw over the latter half of last season. But let's focus in on weeks one through four, because Zeke suffered the partially torn PCL in week four of 2021. That's when the injury uh, occurred. So I wanted to look at what was his production weeks one through four when he was fully healthy. Through that time frame, here's where he ranked in some important categories. Tied for first in touchdowns at the running back position. Sixth overall in rush attempts. Fourth in rushing yards. Tied for fourth in yards after contact. Tied for fourth in 10 plus yard runs. Fourth in PFF's rushing grades through, uh, weeks, through week four. And he was also the RB5 in fantasy through that time frame. So if we are willing to say what happened last year from weeks five on for the remainder of the year with Zeke is completely dependent upon his injury and the injury that he sustained in week four, then we are getting a massive, massive discount this year on Zeke. And I understand it. I had Zeke in fantasy last year. It was rough. If he didn't score you a touchdown, you were not happy that you rolled him out there in your starting lineup. But if we can get him back fully healthy this year, which all indications are that he's coming back ready to go then we could get a massive discount here with Zeke in the third round, RB17 off the board behind David Montgomery. Uh, I mean, Saquon Barkley, Antonio Gibson at RB13. I feel like I will gladly take Zeke over Antonio Gibson right now with all the concerns, injury concerns, but then you got Brian Robinson and JD McKissick back in town, right? I'll take Zeke over those guys. All right, Zeke Elliott there in round three. Let's move on to round four here, 37 through 48. List off these guys really quick. George Kittle, Justin Herbert, Jalen Waddle, DK Metcalf at number 40 overall. Then we got J.K. Dobbins, Josh Jacobs, James Conner, Darren Waller, Elijah Mitchell, Terry McLaurin, D.J. Moore, and Lamar Jackson. Out of this grouping, who stands out to you? So a guy that is going anywhere from the early fifth to the late fourth, I've seen him fall. And depending on you know where you're doing drafts, whether it's ECR, ADP, I know in a lot of best ball drafts, he's creeping up a lot right now. So I, I think that we're going to see this continue. And the player that I'm massive in on, we've heard all of the the press clippings, all the beat writer reports, training camps, OTAs, and the videos, the hype videos, Yates, are out <laughs> there in the about streets. Those. Can't forget about those. No, you can't, man. And I'm, I'm buying into it. And this is not just the hype videos, but we've seen him perform at an elite level. Cortland Sutton is such a smash. Whether you can get him at the early fifth or the late fourth, I've seen him go in both ranges, and I'm willing to sit here and dive in all, all, the entire body, just, just diving straight into the shallow end, deep end, wherever, in the pool. Give me as much Cortland Sutton as I possibly can handle this year, because I think Cortland Sutton was on a projected path. Basically, in 2019, in his breakout season, we're looking at a wide receiver that was 12th in yards per route run overall. He was on his way to establishing himself as being one of the league's elite players. And then what happened? He got hurt in 2020, and then he came back in terrible quarterback play in 2021. We know yep. all of this. Cortland Sutton is set to reemerge as this shining light in the Denver passing attack like we saw in 2019. We've seen him do it once. I'm willing to bet he's going to do it again because like even last year, he was the deep weapon for the Broncos. I think he's going to reprise that role. And if you're telling me we're getting an upgrade from the deep completion rates of Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locks of the world to Russell Wilson, <laughs> I'm in all the way in, dude. And this is the cool thing with Cortland Sutton, too, is that he's number 70 overall currently in ADP That's consensus, craziness. right? So you're talking about, we're talking about players that are 37 to 48. You're bypassing all of those guys and just saying, man, take Cortland Sutton here. This is where you should be taking Cortland Sutton, and yet you can get him at that discount, right? That's the important part to point out here as well. For me, I'm going to go with James Conner in this range. And with James Conner, I think that we have to recognize that he's probably not going to be a top five running back this next year. We have to acknowledge the durability concerns. But yeah, I wanted to look back when Chase Edmonds missed time with an injury last year, when James Conner was the RB1 for this team. And taking a look at that and saying, what did we get from James Conner? So last season, Chase Edmonds missed weeks 10 through 14 with an injury. In that time frame, Conner was the RB5 in all of fantasy football. He had 207 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns, 197 receiving yards, and another receiving touchdown in that time frame. Either this is what we should be expecting from James Conner this year, or we should be ranking Daryl Williams a lot higher than what we are currently, right? If we're going to get James Conner being the guy who sees 70% of the work in this backfield, then we need to be ranking him a lot higher than where he's going currently in ADP. Otherwise, 
we can really get a safe RB2 option, one who has the upside to score touchdowns every single week. We know that in this offense. And then we need to rank Daryl Williams a lot higher in that same territory that we did with Chase Edmonds last year because he's going to step into that Chase Edmonds role, right? So there's some concern here. There's some question about what this backfield is going to look like, but we, as far as the overall usage, but we don't have those concerns about James Conner being the RB1 in this backfield in a top five scoring offense here in Arizona. So James Conner here, round four is my early round value. I would love to get him as my RB2. If you can tell me that I can lock up Joe Mixon in round one, then I can get CD Lamb in round two. Maybe I take that wide receiver in round three again, and then I can get James Conner in round four as that RB2. That's an excellent strategy to start out the drafts. So let's go here, round five, 49 through 60, wrap it up here. Uh, let's list off these players. Michael Pittman Jr. at 49 overall. Then we got Amari Cooper, Travis Etienne, Joe Burrow, Chris Godwin, Damian Harris, Kyler Murray, TJ Hawkinson, Michael Thomas, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Brees Hall, and then AJ Dillon. I like a lot of the players in this range. For you, who stands out? So I could just go on another Michael Pittman rant. That would be easy. That'd be the low hanging fruit for me. I, I love Pittman this year, but I'm going to go with a player that if you're looking in the best ball streets versus ECR, he's going to rise. And I know that's been a lot of my theme of this show, but these are players that you can get late. And I'm telling you to take the jump in and this could sound aggressive, but this player needs to be there. He's going to be there because if you look at best ball ADPs, 54th overall, he's wide receiver 26. Rashad Bateman, people need to wake up, smell the roses, enjoy life, and draft him as a top 24 wide receiver. There's really like, look, Baltimore, we, yes, they're going to run the ball. Whoa, shocker, shocker. They're going to run the ball. I know, I get that. I understand it. Rashad Bateman, even last year, when we saw a small sample size for a player that even, he didn't play in 80% of the snaps until week 15, Yates, and he still mm -hmm. finished with top 36 numbers in 50% of his games. We're going to see the evolution of Rashad Bateman right in front of our eyes. He's going to step forward as the true X. He's going to compete with Mark Andrews for targets on a weekly basis. He is that good. An elite level prospect coming out of college. And even last year, if you look, go ahead over to Matt Harmon's amazing work of Reception Perception. What he charted Rashad Bateman was absolute ooh, chef's kiss, <laughs> my man. 85th percentile against zone coverage. 81st against press. These are the numbers you want to see for a budding superstar, an X wide receiver, and people are going to go back to the, Ooh, Baltimore's going to run a lot. I don't care. Yes, they're going to run a lot. They're going to run their passing game as well through Rashad Bateman and Mark Andrews. We're talking about Marquise Hollywood Brown was had the 12th highest target share amongst all wide receivers and finished as the wide receiver 21 in fantasy points per game. Rashad Bateman was a much better prospect, and I don't think it's a hot take than Marquise Hollywood Brown could have ever hoped to be. So you're telling me that he, he's got no target competition outside of Mark Andrews. He's got the talent to step forward. We saw it in small sample sizes last year, and he can't be a top 24 wide receiver like Marquise Brown was last year? Come on, people. Wake up. Smell the roses. Draft Rashad Bateman. Now. Please. Now. Not later. Now. Do it now. Here's the thing with Rashad Bateman. You, the overall volume, probably not going to be there. It's not going to be a Cooper Cup or, you know, towards the top of the league as far as overall targets. But I was doing some research earlier today and came across this, right? Lamar Jackson is touchdown rate in 2019 and 2020, 9%, which is just stupid. 9% touchdown rate. Then in 2020, 6.9%. Last year, when we didn't have J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, the guys to get that run game rolling, right? We were moving forward with Devontae Freeman mm -hmm. and Latavius Murray as the guys who were supposed to open up the offense for Lamar Jackson in the passing game, dropped down to 4.2% touchdown rate for Lamar Jackson. If we can get that number back up to 5.5%, at least minimum, then we're looking at Rashad Bateman having the potential as the wide receiver one in this offense to finish with eight plus touchdowns this next year. So the overall target volume might not be there, but he can make up for it in the touchdown department. So that's why Rashad Bateman does have plenty of upside this year, even if Baltimore is going to see their pass attempts t drop way down. And I think it is. I think it's going to drop down significantly because that offense last year was broken. He can make up for it in the touchdown department. You mentioned that you will not take the low-hanging fruit. I will gladly take the low-hanging fruit <laughs> of Michael Pittman Jr., my Love friend. It. I will absolutely talk here about a guy that I've been in on for the past couple of years, coming out of USC, absolutely loved him. Last season for wide receivers with over 75 targets, Michael Pittman Jr. ranked within the top 15 in yards yards per route run, and that was with Carson Wentz as his quarterback. He was 16th in the entire NFL last year with 1,082 receiving yards and had just six touchdowns. So this wide receiver core this year in Indianapolis is his. It's completely his. 
And Matt Ryan, no matter what your opinion is of Ryan, he's an upgrade over Carson Wentz at this point of his career too. So wide receiver 18 off the board right now. He's wide receiver 11 in my rankings. This is what we call a value, people. When we are looking at a guy who is way down the board in ADP, higher in the rankings, this is someone that, again, to go back to a point that you made earlier, you don't have to draft. You don't have to draft mm -hmm. A.J. Brown at that spot. But the difference in rankings is signaling to you that this is a guy that you need to star. This is a guy that you need to underline. You need to, in your drafts, you need to be looking at and saying, I'm going to draft here, draft Michael Pittman Jr. a couple spots earlier than maybe I need to, maybe a round earlier than I need to, to ensure that I get him on my roster. Michael Pittman Jr., that last player here in early round values that I wanted to point out. You said that you weren't going to talk about him, but I'm going to give you the opportunity, man. Anything to add there on Michael Pittman Jr.? I love the call, and I have him as a wide receiver one as well in my ranks, and I'm way above consensus, and I'm totally in on it. And people, I think people want to push back against the hype, and they want to say, okay, maybe Matt Ryan's washed. He's a massive upgrade over Carson Wentz. That, that cannot be stated enough. As well as we've seen Michael Pittman perform at this type of level, Yates, before the Colts realized how terrible Carson Wentz was. And they woke up and they said, oh, we want to win games. And this is almost a playoff team. If they didn't implode last year in right. the final week, Jackson they would have made the playoffs. <laughs> right. And so we're seeing, I think this, again, we're talking about offenses that are going to throw more than people realize. The upgrade from Carson Wentz to Matt Ryan, we're going to see the Colts revisit what they tried to do to begin the, the season last year. Mm -hmm. And when the Colts were trying to go pass heavy, Michael Pittman was the wide receiver 15 in fantasy points per game. So you're telling me with the upgrade in quarterback play, the revisiting of a higher passing rate, and the touchdowns are probably going to go up with improved quarterback play. And Michael Pittman can't go from like the wide receiver 15 range to the wide receiver 12, or maybe even a little bit higher of the targets. And Matt Ryan's just like, well... I don't really want to throw the ball to Jelani Woods. I don't want to throw the ball right. to Moelle Cox. I don't want to throw the ball to Paris Campbell. I'm just going to feed Michael Pittman on every play. Yeah, totally in with it, Yates. Yeah, and the thing too, on top of all of that, Alec Pierce added to the offense, who is a size speed guy to draw attention away. I don't think Alec Pierce is going to be anything dominant from a fantasy perspective mm -hmm. anytime soon. He has potential, but what he's going to do is take away attention from Michael Pittman Jr. So this is a guy that I am absolutely all in on, have him everywhere because of how much I have loved him throughout the first two years of his career. I think we're in line for a massive, massive breakout here in 2022. All right, D-Bro, thank you so much for taking some time out to jump onto the podcast, man. Why don't you let everyone know what you got going on there over at fantasy pros yeah man i mean look uh, just like you diving through the weeds getting through the work and stuff i've got um i'm gonna put out some correlations for best ball and stuff in the upcoming weeks i'm working on a redraft kit that goes live this june uh so uh my perfect draft is already live my players to target are is in the works will be live at fantasypros.com pretty soon um as well as all the other parts of pieces so how i'm approaching drafts early, middle, and late rounds, and everything in between, man. So thank you again for having me back on the podcast. It's always a good time to talk ball with Yates. This was a blast. For sure. And at Debro underscore FFB on Twitter, make sure to go over and give him a follow. All right, remember, before we get out of here, Fantrax giveaway, DK Metcalf, signed Seattle Seahawks jersey, the ffplaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway, F-A-N-T-R-A-X giveaway to get entered into this giveaway runs through the month of July. So do not waste any time. Go over to the ffplaybook.com slash fan giveaway to get entered now. All right, that'll do it for Derek Brown. I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time.